the death of Alexei Navalny is a major, shocking, but not surprising event. It is an intentional act of political killing, secondary to prolonged torture, led on to underlying poor health caused by Kremlin poisoning. For Putin, the tyrant who couldn't even say Navalny's name in public, this is an own goal. It's not going to work out in his favor. Before we go on, a warning. The Kremlin will saturate the informational environment with deliberately contradictory messages about what happened. Be aware of that. You're going to hear that it's an accident, that the West did it, that the Kremlin had no motives for it, and so on. Let's look at who Navalny was, why he died, and what this means for the future of Putin's brutal regime. Navalny stood out among the Russian opposition for being a political animal. His stance against Putin's regime wasn't activist or moralized. It was all about change, transformation, agency, creating instability, creating conflict, and that made him stand out against peers who very often engaged in activism rather than politics. Navalny was also extraordinarily ambitious, to the point that witnessing that even via a screen could leave one exhausted. He was thinking about whether every little thing he did was something that was going to get him closer or further away from his political goals. He also had a kind of sense of freedom, even though he was in chains, a remarkable capacity to feel free no matter what happened to him. That generated enormous political courage, the kind of courage that led him to return to Russia after the Kremlin poisoned him, knowing what the consequences were likely to be. This is an own goal for Putin. Putin has now penciled Navalny in as a descendant of the 19th century tradition of Russian anti-authoritarian activism and literature, folks from Belinsky to Bakunin. Now Putin kept Navalny alive for such a long time because he understood the downsides of ending Navalny's life. And it's also possible that what the Kremlin did is simply introduced a systemic and significant risk of Navalny's death and waited to see what happens. But the bottom line is that this is not an entirely sober act of political calculation by the Kremlin. There is an element of vengeance and vindictiveness here and that may well backfire for Putin. With the historical significance of Navalny now growing and becoming a political force, if not immediately, then in the years to come. What this tells us about the Putin regime is really significant. We're not just looking at a dreadful regime engaged in a loathsome war. We're looking at a regime that is and thinks of itself as being at the beginning stages of a series of totalitarian turns. That's a paradoxical thing for the regime because they are making inroads into a depoliticized population, politicizing it even though they need it to remain depoliticized. They're going to experience bumps along this road. But we're going to see widening of repression at home, from overt opponents to milder opponents to simply people who contradict the image of a nation at war with NATO, at war with the world being picked up. And there is also going to be a deepening of repression. Navalny's death shows us that people who are on the regime's blacklist may be, in time, lined up for physical destruction. And these totalitarian turns at home are inseparable from a pattern of escalation abroad. The reason for the totalitarian turns is regime security that is going to be expressed in a large-scale standoff against the West, against NATO, that may or may not take the form of an overt conflict. So the point of this clamping down inside is that this stuff is going to come toward us, capacity allowing, in years to come. What is Navalny's political legacy? His most important impact may well, as we've just said, be posthumous. But what he did in his life was important and really hard. He was trying to politicize a radically depoliticized population. That's a little bit like being an activist against harassment at work in 1900 before the concept of harassment exists. It's a really difficult enterprise and he alone among the Russian opposition stood out as somebody 
capable of politicizing the Russian space. He had a couple of weaknesses. A minor weakness was his aversion to coalition building. A major weakness that is understandable in his complex historical milieu is, in the end, his ability to politicize not being complemented by an ability to offer an alternative. These are the two things you've got to do as the Russian opposition. You politicize and you offer an alternative. Navalny's ideas toward an alternative path for his country too much became derivations of a story about how Russia needs to live like the civilized world, like the West. Navalny was not an intellectual, but there was a Fukuyamian teleology structuring his idea of what Russia's future might hold. And that ended up leaving us in a situation where the very last person to offer a vision on the Russian space, whether you think the vision is good, bad or incoherent, remains Gorbachev. At this point, a routine question might arise, and that is, was Mr. Navalny a Russian imperialist? Now, you've got to feel two bits to the answer to that question, actually. The first is that if the Russian opposition have a problem with imperialism, it's less about positive imperialist instinct and more about that incapacity to offer an alternative, because to develop an adequate relationship with imperialism, you've got to come out of it, visualize an alternative, and then take practical political steps toward it. And the second bit of the answer you've got to feel through is that there is a danger of us ourselves developing a consumerist and depoliticized relationship with the Russian opposition. Let's quickly think about this. Mr. Navalny responded to the annexation of Crimea in 2014 by calling it illegal and unacceptable, but then he went on to say that Crimea isn't a sandwich that can just be passed back to Ukraine. Now, it's possible to analyze this psychologically and sociologically, but there isn't much politics in this. Why? Because nobody is offering us people in the West, or indeed Ukrainians, members of the Russian opposition, as consumable goods we might want to buy or not, or as potential political leaders for our countries. No, they're folks who are acting politically on the Russian space, and the political question we have to ask about it is, is what they are doing serving our interests or not? And if it's not, how could we encourage them to do things that are going to serve our political interests more? That's an answer that's properly political. What are the implications for the Russian opposition? At this time, our thoughts go out to everybody connected with Mr. Navalny, the way we daily think of Ukrainians. But there are big political implications. Mr. Navalny's death is as big a political event as any on the Russian space since Putin started his brutal invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. As big as the mobilization in autumn 2022 and as big, indeed bigger, than Mr. Prigozhin's mutiny. What one positively wishes for the Russian opposition as a Westerner is unity and work toward being united and working together. The continuation of Mr. Navalny's endeavors at politicizing the Russian space and the taking up of the challenge with which Mr. Navalny struggled, which is to offer a political alternative on the Russian space. And that means offering it to everybody there, not just the sliver of the liberal democratic opposition, but the big depoliticized blob in the middle, the fervent radicals who might be more hardline than Putin himself, the state apparatuses, and the institution of the army. This is real politics. But what else should we think? I invite us to think of what happened as sending two bolts of lightning through us. First is just how shocking what happened is and how it reminds us of the importance of keeping our democracies on the rails. The second bolt of lightning it sends us is that Mr. Navalny died battling something that Ukrainians are battling daily that isn't just a problem on the ex-Soviet space and isn't just a problem in Eastern Europe. It's a problem that is heading our way unless it runs out of capacity or we stop it.
and to understand more about the significance of that and the possibility of further escalation between Russia and NATO in the years to come, you could watch this video next.